Hello everybody, Raven Knight here, and welcome back to the last episode of our Ten Commandments Bible Study series. This has been a very fun series to go through. I'm really happy to finally be wrapping it up, uh, but I hope you guys have gotten something good out of it. If you were brand new to the series, welcome. Uh, you've come at the tail end, so you may want to go back and watch all the other episodes of this. You can get them all in the playlist. But if you followed me all the way from the beginning till now, thank you for sticking with me on this very long and exciting journey. we got a lot to talk about today because the last commandment given in the Ten Commandments is a very important one, and doing my studies on it, really revealed a whole lot and I can't wait to share all that with you now. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. If you'd open up your Bible to Exodus chapter 20, we're going to be in chapter 20 verse 17, but we're all going to be jumping to a few other Bible verses today. So go ahead and be ready to jump verses uh, here and there. We'll be jumping into the New Testament a little bit. Uh, but once you're at Exodus 20, go to verse 17, <clears throat> last commandment, and it reads, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now you can um, condense this whole thing into what it says at the very beginning. You shall not covet your neighbor's house or anything that belongs to them. Do not covet. Now some of you may hear that and go, what does covet mean? What's that mean? Well, before we can unpack this final command, we need to understand what that says. To covet means to long or lust for something. So the commandment is essentially saying, don't long or lust after something belonging to your neighbor. Essentially, do not give in to envious desire. Okay, that's pretty much what it's saying. Don't be jealous of what other people have. Now, I already hear you saying, Raven, you're saying we can't even be jealous? I can't say, dang, dude, I wish I had what you do. Well, let me put it this way. There is nothing at all wrong with admiring your neighbor's belongings. There's nothing wrong with saying, man, that is a nice car you got, or man, my neighbor's wife is so beautiful. You know, that's fine. That's okay. But succumbing to envy leads to a lot of dangerous things. Now, why? Envy breeds feelings of resentment towards your neighbor and towards God because at the end of the day, envy is the root of almost every other sin. Why? Well, this is why I said we need to prepare. Go ahead and uh, put your, keep your finger on this. But flip to the book of James. James is way into the New Testament. Go until you find James. <clears throat> and we're going to be on James chapter 1, verse, for t verse 15. It says here, James chapter 1, verse 15. If you need to pause the video, please do. Just get to James 1. It says, Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Read that, read that first bit. After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Sin's origin, is an, sin's origin is not some little devil whispering ideas into your head. A lot of people get this idea that, oh man, I didn't mean to sin. The devil made me do it. You know, I, I, it's not my fault. The devil was, you know, manipulating me. You know that song in the Hunchback of Notre Dame when uh, Frodo was saying that, you know, it's in God's plan. He made the devil so much stronger than a man. Like, good line. But it is missing the point. Sin is internal. It's within you. And our hearts is a sinful desire to do wrong. And envy, at the end of the day, is a love of self. It's a selfish desire to have what others have. And when you let yourself dwell on these things, it develops ugliness. It develops into a hate for others. The more, you the more love you pour into your own selfish wants, the more you start to resent your neighbor. You might begin saying like, God, why don't I have that thing? Don't I deserve it more than them? And then if you go from there, there's the chance you may act on that thing. Don't I deserve it more than them? Shouldn't I get this? Well, maybe you need to take it. It leads to quite a few of the other commandments we've already discussed. Do you lust after someone's spouse? Does someone have a really hot wife or husband? And then you decide, you know what, I want them for myself. And that develops into the adulterous sin we discussed a few weeks ago. What about their money or property? Would you steal for it? And let's not forget the chance you might actually murder to get what you want. And you're probably thinking, <laughs> Raven, okay, a little jealousy isn't going to hurt anybody, okay? Too far-fetched? Look at the world we live in. Just take a moment. Look at the world we live in and tell me that it's impossible. I, don't, I try not to get too political here, but let's actually talk about something that I noticed from the Democratic political party. What is one of the talking points you hear a lot from them? At least I hear it a lot. Eat the rich. The rich need to pay more in taxes. 
Their entire political campaign of the left has always been one of envy and coveting. They have more, so you deserve more. You're owed your dues. And from this call to envy, we see the rise of hate. Hate and avarice between people over what they have or don't have. A large reason for the disunity and insanity of today's world is because we've encouraged people to covet. To want what others have. Trying to say there should be no millionaires or billionaires. They shouldn't have more than you. That's not morally right that they have more than you. You deserve more. You've gone through more. You're a victim. You need more than what you have. Covet. And if you don't get what you want, you need to raise Cain. You need to lose your mind. You need to get upset. You need to make a statement. So much of what the leftist political party pushes is covetousness. Now, I'm not saying that the right political party doesn't have their own sins to deal with. They do. But this is the common one I hear from them. Covetousness has led to so many problems with our country, with our world, where we look at people who have things better than us or different from us, and we say, I wish I had that. And it's not always easy. I'll confess, I can feel jealous and envious. I'm jealous of my friends Jay and Hannah, who draw so well. I wish I was that skilled. I'm jealous of my buddy Havoc for being such a great for honor player and having such a large subscriber base. I'm jealous of my dad for how wise and successful he is. I'm jealous of my own brother for how knowledgeable and patient he is in all he does. I'm jealous of the man who stole the heart of the girl I loved. I'll keep them both anonymous, especially since he's a friend of mine. I'm jealous of my cousin who is about to be a father in a few days. There are so many things I'm jealous of. And yet, I don't hate these people or resent them. How? How is that possible? Turn again to the book of Philippians 2.3. Philippians 2.3 lays this out beautifully. Again, if you need to pause the video to get to Philippians 2.3, do that. But go to Philippians 2.3, where it reads, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. This is a clear command. Value others above yourself. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. There's a difference. God calls us not to be selfish, but to be selfless. To love others and to value others above ourselves. Why do you think I love self-sacrifice so much? Because it is the highest fo form of giving more to others than to yourself. As Jesus famously said, there can be no greater form of love than this, that you lay down your life for a friend. There is no greater form of love than this. When you give to others, when you share with others, when you love others, you don't hold them with resentment. You don't look at what they have and say, I want that. You look at what they have and you're proud of them for it. I love Hannah and Jay and all they do for me. They do wonderful art, and the fact that they share that art with me is a blessing. I love Havoc as a friend and a fellow content creator, and I care about his plights and needs. I'm envious of the fact that he's so good, but I also know the fact that he earned that spot. He earned where he is through his hard work, his dedication. That's why he got it. I love my father and brother, his family, and my closest friends. I love my friend and, fia and his fiance. And I'm honestly happy for them both, despite the hurt. And I am, and I absolutely love my cousin and his wife. And I will love their baby girl with all my heart when she is born. Why? Because envy and resentment are born from loving only yourself. But happiness and friendship is born from loving others before yourself. And yes, sometimes it hurts not getting the things we want and seeing others get them. I've been there. You ever tried playing a lottery or a bingo competition and someone gets the prize you really wanted? Hey, been there. But in those moments, God wants us to smile and be happy for our neighbors, family, and friends. Show love to them, and in making yourself least, God will elevate you in his own way. Jesus said it in Luke 9, 48, For it is the one who is least among you all who is the greatest. Consider this for a moment. Jesus, the Son of God, humbled himself, coming to earth as nothing more than a carpenter's son in a backwater, nowhere town called Nazarene, which everyone looks at and says, what's Nazarene ever given anyone? What's a Nazarite going to do for anybody? He was born in a stable. He had nothing to his name. He humbled himself in the most 
debased way possible, born to nobody, born in a barn, essentially. But there was no resentment. There was no, God, why couldn't you have let me be born in a palace among servants of opulence? He never said that. He never wanted it. When you humble yourself, when you lower yourself for the sake of others, that is when you will see God's rewards. And want to know something funny? That's one of the reasons I don't boast or brag a lot, or at least I try not to. I have low self-esteem by nature, and I'm often hard on myself, more so than I probably should be. But by acknowledging my own shortcomings and by showing joy in the success of my friends and family, I begin to more clearly see the gifts God has given me, the things I have that others might be jealous of that God has done for me. To wrap things up, I want to say this. I had a girlfriend who I dated in college who said something very beautiful, and I held on to it over the years. I think that it's something we should all, you know, remember now. A butterfly can never know the beauty of its own wings, as it cannot look to see them. It will forever see itself as the ugly caterpillar it began as, while looking on an envy at the other butterflies in the garden. But does that mean it's not beautiful? No. God made it beautiful. And perhaps if the butterfly learns to look with God's eyes, he can see just how God sees him and realize he's more beautiful than any other creature in God's garden. Don't live a life filled with envy or covetousness or jealousy. The more you look at the world and compare what you have to the world, the more miserable you will be, the angrier you will be, the more shut off you will be. You won't want to associate with people because you'll feel slighted by them. Stop looking at the world and comparing their beauty to yours. Think about the things you have, the things you're blessed with. And I know you're probably going to say, easy for you to say, I'm not blessed with anything. Have you stopped to think about it? Have you even stopped to think about what you're blessed with? Even if it's minor. Let me put it this way. How are you listening to this video right now? I'm betting you're doing it on a computer or a phone or something, right? You have those. Do you know that there are many, many, many people in the world who don't even have that luxury? That is a blessing in and of itself. Maybe you don't have the newest phone. Maybe you don't have the newest computer. But you have it. You have something. Do you have a roof over your head? That's a blessing. Maybe it's not the most expensive roof. Maybe it's not a palace or a mansion, but you have a roof. How do you make money? Do you have a job? May not be the most high paying job, may not be the easiest job, but you have a job. And in this economy, that's a very, very good thing. Guys, as we wrap up this 10 commandments Bible study, I want you to consider your blessings. I want you to consider what God has blessed you with. Don't look at everything in terms of what you don't have versus what you want and what you feel entitled to. Think of the things you are blessed with that God has given you and think about how you can bless others with what you've been given. It's not easy and I, you're going to stumble and fall. I'm going to stumble and fall. And I think that's something we always need to remember. We look at these Ten Commandments, guys. As we wrap this up, I want you all to know, as we look at these Ten Commandments, I'm sure a lot of you are saying, Raven, I'll be real honest, some of these I don't know if I can do. Well, you know what? I got great news for you. God knew that. God knew that. Do you want to know why Jesus came down to earth to talk to us about these Ten Commandments? Because he does. He lays, like he's the one who laid out. You know, you've heard it said, thou shalt not murder. But I tell you, if you even look at your brother with hatred in your heart, you've committed murder. You've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But if you even think about a woman with lustfulness, you've committed adultery. Here's the thing. How can we avoid our own thoughts? God knows we can't do it. He knows that these commandments are impossible for us to meet. That was the point. The law is impossible because the law is to God's standards and we can't meet the standard of perfection. That was always the point. But... But, bear this in mind. Jesus came to earth to give us a way out of damnation. We can't be good enough. We are going to make mistakes. We're going to sin and screw up. But Jesus made it so that we can rely on him for salvation. Now, does that mean we, can, we are free from this? We don't have to follow the Ten Commandments? Absolutely not. We have to try. We have to live a Christ-like life. 
because that is the evidence of Christ within us. But don't be afraid. Don't have fear. Don't look at life like walking on eggshells. Don't look at the Ten Commandments of, oh, how do I follow this? Am I following this correctly? <laughs> no, don't treat it that way. Treat the Ten Commandments the way they were meant to be treated by the Lord. A guide. Not just a list of do's and don'ts. A guide of how to live a happier, Christ-like, prosperous life. How to build a society that will prosper, that will be godly. That is the purpose of the Ten Commandments. That's what they were always there for. And I hope now that we've wrapped up this series, you can see that. Thank you guys so much for joining me on this series. This has been a load of fun for me. I hope it's been fun for you. And now that we're all done, we'll move on to the next Bible study series. Uh, I might take a break next week so that um, I have some time to read up on what I need to talk about. I think we'll be doing a series on Samson. I believe that's what everyone wanted me to talk about. And that won't take long, probably about two or three days on that. So really look forward to that. But with all that out of the way, thank you again. God bless. And I will see you in my next video. Take care.